but uh, we're gonna try to make it soft for for everyone in uh, Dubai, okay, and also in, in in everywhere in the world, okay, because we have the the Zoom um, system also. Um, so this session is. Um, we will discuss about the CCUS, carbon capture, utilization, and storage, as well as the, the hydrogen um, technologies that uh, I believe that everyone um, rely that um, is very important for the energy transition. So today, we have um, five um, speakers from uh, multidisciplinary, you know, from uh, industry, from uh, state-owned enterprise, and also from uh, institutes, uh, as um, from faculty of engineering to Gone University. So first of all, maybe I would like to ask uh, each of our speaker to introduce yourself yeah. shortly. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Warong. I'm a professor in Department of Chemical Engineering, um, Jolong Gone University. Okay. So let's move to the next. Uh, my name is Dr. Sit Chamanakup. I'm acting EVP from PTEP, uh, National Energy Companies. Good morning, everyone. My name is Pierre Booth. I'm the managing director of BIG, which is part of Air Products, who is the largest hydrogen producer in the world. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm, my name is Richard Wang I am also a lecturer from Department of Chemical Engineering, Jhulalongkorn University. Okay, Kap. And one more. We have uh, Dr. Noreen Pawanit. Okay, who who cannot join us on uh, physical today, but um, he he prepared some things. Okay, for for the um, some video sessions, you know, to to share with uh, all of us. So let's move to our first speaker who sit beside me. Okay, <laughs> Professor Dr. Warung. Okay, from uh, Faculty of Engineering, Jhulalongkorn University. So. As we discussed before this session, uh, Dr. Warong will, will tell us about um, why do we need you know, um, CCUS, and if, if you can cover a little bit on hydrogen, it's, it's really, it will be very interesting. Yeah. Dr. Warong, come. Okay, I think I have a couple minutes, and my part is Not, not a couple short. minutes, longer than that. Longer it's than okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a slide that I prepared. Uh, basically, because we are in the scientific community, we play with numbers, right? So in order to get um, balance between the CO2 uh, emission and CO2 source, source and sink, we need to look at the number. Mm. The, the red one is uh, emission, basically a source from various sector in, in Thailand. The round number will be at about 200 uh, million ton per year. Mm. In order to make a neutral, ne neutrality, mm. it, we need on the, the green side in order to make it equal. The majority, about 120 um, million ton per year, can be absorbed by nature, by forestation. <laughs> but we cannot grow tree all over the country. We need land for other purposes. So in order to make the number, the 16 percent or 16 million tons, that can be obtained by increasing the efficiency of working. Um, basically, you increase how we work and doing this and that a little bit we can make that number the rest that's our problem mm. how can we achieve such balance without disturbing too much of our daily life um, operation or our the way of living so let me move to to the next slide no no oh, okay previous one please okay, okay. This one on the left-hand side, that's a big picture that we try to imagine ourselves. The, the problem is net zero is something that is going down. If you look from the left to the right, it's, flow, it's flowing down right now. The function is nonlinear in scientific term because it's not, it will get bigger, worse if we wait longer. So we think that in order to um, cope up with this problem, we need to act fast, and we, we need to act now, okay? That's the model of our faculty anyway, act now. And we know that doing this, bearing the load by ourselves or by anybody cannot do it alone. So we need collaboration, of course. We need to col collaborate. We need to change the way of thinking. 
So if you look at the problem coming down, we think that uh, we, talk, we have to start early. If we, if we look from the way we push the load up in order to achieve net zero, we know that we cannot do it alone. And the longer we wait, the harder it will hit, hit us. So playing with the number, going back to the green, green graph, you see that uh, there are two options right now, either carbon capture, and what, we, what do we do with the capture of carbon, carbon dioxide? One thing is basically just put it underground, which is called CCS, a storage, or utilize by convert CO2 to something else more valuable. If we ask um, industry, any private sector, of course, everybody want to use CO2 as a raw material that we can convert to something more valuable because of the cost structure, economic structure. But if you look at the number, number one and number 1.5, the number one is the amount of CO2 that can be converted to methanol based on the current use of methanol in Thailand. If we assume that all the methanol that we currently use in Thailand can be obtained from conversion of CO2 100%, we can absorb only that much. So CCU by itself is not enough. Not mentioning about the cost, that methanol converted from CO2 might be five times, four times, even more pricier than conventional CO2 from petroleum. So how can we make use of that? And how can we do something to get the goal that we need? I, I think this is something like a war between our humanity and nature. In this kind of war, somebody will die for sure. But everybody must adjust themselves. So the rest, the gray area, of course, we need to rely on uh, CCS, the storage, because the capacity of putting CO2 underground is huge. The only problem is the cost. If we take the cost to be super low, right now, let's say 10 US dollar per ton, which is everybody will know that very low right now. Mm -hmm. By that number, about uh, 80, 80 million tons per year, we have to invest about two, eight, 800 US dollar per year. That's the number that we need to put underground. Who are going to pay for that? And that would be absorbed by whatever everybody would, would have to cope with that number. So that's come to what we think that we should do today. Next slide, please. Okay. So this is what we try to do. In Thailand, we know that the majority, um, about one third of CO2 emission comes from industry. And I'm from chemical engineering department. So we know that at least we can do something with this sector. And we know that we cannot do it alone. So right now, the bottleneck that uh, squeezes us is two things. First would be technology. Technology that is mature enough to do it commercially. The second one would be cost. We need technology that is cheap enough so that we can do it and not everybody will suffer. So we try to do the collaboration. We call this one CCUS Technology Development Consortium. And we found about eight companies, eight big company in Thailand, so that we form some, some sort of like ecosystem so that Chulalongkorn University as a leader, leader in research can lead this um, change by using technology. We drive, we, we think that one way to do, to solve this problem is to lead with technology. And right now, nobody in the world has mature technology. So it is opportunity, at actually, it is a mission for everybody to help these topics. And our university devote ourselves to do this to society as well. So we think that the two, two arrows in this picture, mm -hmm. the one on top is the technology that is um, ready in some certain level. It has some high TLL uh, level. So by forming ecosystem like this, we can find a value chain, we can spin off that technology to get commercial scale easier than any single company to do, to do it alone. That's one way to do it. But the more important way is the second one, the, the second arrow, the technology that is not ready at the moment. 
the technology that needs research. We, knew, we need to do it today so that it would grow bigger and bigger in time for us to use in the future. So that's why we form and that's why we emphasize on the collaboration in order to solve this problem. And I think that today we all realize that there is no one single solution for this problem anymore. We need every possible opportunity. We need ev every solution available, and we need to do it everything at the same time. And everybody must join hands to do it together. And I think it is good opportunity for us to present this kind of idea here so that we can gain momentum and gain our partner to, to do it together. I will stop here and pass a okay. mic to my colleague. Okay, come. Thank you, Dr. Wrong. Um, okay, I, I, I think that we, we can see the, uh, the number as a very first picture that Dr. Wrong showed us, and we can see the, uh, the, the exponential forces that we have to join and to work together. And luckily, that um, in, in this stage, you know, we, we have um, three partners you know, who already joined the CCUS Consortium, right, on board. So for, for the next speaker, it should be. Uh, Dr. Nopasit from PTTEP. Thank you, Dr. O. Actually, I'm also a chemical engineer. We went to the same candidate school. Okay. Same advisor. Same advisor also. But we may have different opinions. Right. I think I want to give you some context about Thailand CCS. I can focus only on CCS, only storage, capture and storage. That's what our cup of tea as an upstream company in Thailand. We know geological structure of Thailand inside out, right? So I think Thailand needs CCS, right? So I think this is the, uh, uh, the data that I stole from ONEP, uh, Thailand National Office of National, uh, uh, National and, uh, Environmental and, and uh, uh, National Resource Planning. This is Thailand pathway to net zero, right? We announced at COP26 that we uh, want to achieve net zero in 2065, right? And, and based on this pathway, um, we need CCS about 40 to 60 million tons per annum. I think as Dr. Warung pointed out, um, if you require 120 million tons per annum from reforestation, you need about 150 uh, million light. You know, this is about half of the country mm. in Thailand. I think it's gonna be challenging. So CCS is so much, right? And we think that Thailand has uh, high sinks potential. Based on our estimation, we think that we have between 10 to 15 gigatons of uh, 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 theoretical storage capacity. So I think that's more than enough. Thailand total emissions around 300, 300 million tons per annum. Yeah. So if we have 15, then we can store it for like 500 years. Yeah. Right, so I think that's potential. And then when you look at the source of emission, you can see that it cluster mostly in two areas. You know, one in the eastern part, where we have industrial estate. And the other part is on this slavery uh, uh, cluster where we have big cement power plants and also power plants, gas fire power plants, right? I mean, up north, uh, I think in the Lampang area, we have coal, coal, uh, uh, my mouth coal fire power plants, right? So to get CCS working, I think we need to match sink and source. But before I get into that uh, uh, details about you know, our project to help the country, why we think CCS is important, because uh, each country they have different uh, pathway to uh, energy transition. I think for Thailand, you know, as developing economy, it's gonna be quick. We cannot phase out fossil fuel uh, uh, immediately, probably take a couple of decades at least, right? But we're gonna switch to gas, natural gas, which is probably the most, uh, the cleanest uh, fossil fuel, right? But how are we gonna make it cleaner? So it has to be abated uh, natural gas. So CCS will come into play, right? Um, and then CCS can play other role as well, you know, other than capture uh, CO2 emission from uh, downstream industry. It also help with uh, CO2 removal in the future if you combine it with uh, direct air capture or by O energy. So become DACCS, uh, VECCS. That can help, you know, uh, reduce uh, uh, CO2 in, the, in our environment. So I think let me delve into uh, uh, what we try to do in Thailand to help the, the nation. Sorry, went too far, right? So this is our concept, why we need collaboration. 
we identify potential big sinks about 100 to 150 kilometers uh, south of uh, eastern uh, industrial area, right? And that area, we can um, <laughs> gather CO2 from multiple source and then combine and then, uh, you know, uh, send it offshore for injection and storage permanently and safely. Why we need it? Because CCS is still expensive. Two ways of reducing the cost, it's through scale and through technology. And look at the cost technology, uh, in, the, in the cost structure of CCS, about 50 to uh, say 60 percent is from capture part. It's not from transportation and storage. In Thailand, we have done some uh, conceptual study. Cost vary between 50 to 180 uh, US dollar per ton for CCS for the entire value chain from capture, transportation, and storage. It depends on the concentration of your emission. The lower emission, the higher the cost because of the capture part. Mm. So this part of technology that, that need uh, collaboration the most, right? In terms of transportation, injection and storage, that's nothing new. Mm -hmm. uh, we done it before. The industry have inject CO2 before, right? We done it for several decades, 30, 40 years, mm. right? It's nothing new, it's just a new application. So that's one area. But the, the other area for collaboration that to make it happen, uh, I, I put it into two categories, one domestically, and the other one will be internationally. Domestically, Thailand uh, doesn't have regulation to do CCS. So we need all the effort to push the government mm -hmm. to come up with this new regulation to support CCS as a business, right, to capture uh, CO2, and then all the technical guidelines and the uh, uh, governance come with it. The other part is, uh, in terms of technology, you mentioned about capturing part that's the most important. The other part that you know is still new, uh, not to Thailand, but I think uh, almost everyone in the world is post-injection mm. monitoring, measurement, and verif verification to make sure that CO2 is still there underground safely, doesn't move anywhere, right? Because I think I believe that uh, we have done a lot of CCS project around the world, but there's no project that come to post closure uh, uh, completion and do the measurement and monitoring. Yeah. So that part is still relatively unknown. You know, when, when we get into the uh, uh, uncharted water, unknown territory, we have to share risk. You know, the government cannot, you know, put the risk into investor or developer itself, need collaboration. And uh, the cost part, I already mentioned about scale and technology, and also funding, because it's going to be a big infrastructure project, right? So uh, if you rely on private investor alone, it's not going to fly. Mm -hmm. Right, so we need to uh, uh, need some support from government and from international communities. Um, and the last one, I think it's the most important one, is about public acceptance. Because sometimes, you know, um, we want to do some good things and we know that it's safe. But to uh, normal people who just have understanding of the technical part, they may think that putting CO2 under the ground in their backyard is something that they don't want to do. <laughs> right, I think it's something that we have to, each other, especially from the uh, uh, academics, need to educate people about the uh, safety, reliability, and you know, applicability of, of CCS. Right? This is about domestic. And internationally, uh, CCS, as I mentioned, uh, is a new application. So to shorten the time, to minimize the mistake they're gonna make, knowledge sharing between the experts in different countries, different areas, is a must. Besides knowledge sharing, I think in terms of you know, standard and practice, is another thing area that we, we should uh, strive forward to. Uh, and last one, this is something that is going to be controversial. It's about you know uh, cross-border CCS network because um, not all con not all the country uh, uh, you know have the uh, equal uh, 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 situations. For example, Japan, Korea, Singapore, they don't have. Uh, things that big enough yeah. for their emission, they need somewhere else to put it, right? Then, if we have mentality that you know we're not gonna accept CO2 from other country in our backyard, you know we're gonna breathe the same air. CO2 from Japan will reach Thailand anyway, yeah. right? So, I think some <laughs> some uh, mindset we have to just. Uh, I think the conversation should be borderless. So I think that's my thought, and then uh, to come with the cross border and transportation and injection. It could be provide opportunity for additional funding, mm. right? It could be some investment for uh, emitter from outside Thailand that can help fund the project, fund the infrastructure. So I think that's probably going to be uh, basically what, what I want to share today. Yeah. Thank you. Ah.
give a big hand to um, Dr. Nopasit Chris. We, we can see uh, two or three things that is uh, very crucial, and I totally agree with the uh, borderless okay, um, collaboration among, among countries. I, I, I think this is very important. Together with the technology, as Dr. Nopasit mentioned about uh, the price of the, the, the capture part, that is also very important. And last but not least, you know, um, the public acceptance is also, even we know that we, we deal with the CO2 gases that, okay, CO2 is something is in the, in the Coca-Cola, in the Pepsi things, but um, this is the, uh, the way that we need to do more, okay? Um, for the next speakers, as we discussed about um, CCUS and the gas aspect is important. That's why for our next speaker, it should be Kun Piyabut, okay, you from uh, the BIG. Take your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Oh, so, uh, good morning again, everyone. So, I'm very honored to share with you, particularly from my background and the, uh, you know, the company I'm working for, Air Products, which is the largest hydrogen producer in the world. Uh, before I'm talking about um, hydrogen as a key driver to accelerate um, the um, energy transition for the world, I think what I'm trying to focus is three words. First thing first is the energy transition. Um, just to try to make sure we are on the same page. Secondly, it's about real action, just to drive, make this happen. And the third one, last but not least, is about ecosystem. Okay, so I think, why don't we just start from um, hydrogen. Um, I hope everyone is aware and familiar with, with hydrogen. And hydrogen has been used in the world for more than 100 years. Uh, mostly, it has been used in the uh, industrial segments as a utilities, as a chemicals. And, and we have done that, you know, for our products, 65 years, for BAG in Thailand, 35 years. So, so in Thailand, we also have um, hydrogen from petrochemical uh, complex in Mataput that, uh, you know, Kunopasit and myself, our companies are located over there. So I think this is not new, right? And everyone is aware today that climate change is real. I'm sure that everyone participating in this COP28 <laughs> acknowledge climate change is real. Um, and, and, and for climate change, I think uh, the ideal scenario is that we want to move to 100% renewable. So far, we have done a great deal of uh, solar power, hydropower, uh, wind power. But again, we, we stuck with something that uh, we call hard to obey segments. Mm -hmm. Because this segment um, is not easily electrified. Um, if you look at the mobility, of course, passenger cars, I think we have EVs, we have BEV, that, that easily done now. But when you talk about trucks, we talk about planes, we talk about, you know, trucks, buses. This cannot be easily electrified, although we have tried to do so, right? The other, another segment is on the um, uh, strategic industries, like steels or cement. I think it's still very challenging to electrify this. Um, Power generation is another uh, industry that is very difficult to electrify. So if you talk about this, the key segments, it's called hard to abate segments. Uh, there's nothing clearly but hydrogen that could come to help this. And because hydrogen is something that we talk about and some, sometimes we debate about hydrogen, so I think we need to talk about what can we make it happen. So hydrogen actually, as I said, we have been used in chemical and utilities, but it's very rare cases that we have been used as energy. And the challenge of hydrogen when we use in energy is about three things, safety, sustainability, and economy. So when we talk about hydrogen, people mostly worry about safety. And I think it's true, though hydrogen is pretty sensitive when it comes to safety, but again, if you look at your fields around yourself, Every field also poses some safety risk. If you track back safety of hydrogen, I think we rarely have uh, you know, major cases. I think we handle with safety quite satisfactorily compared to other fields that we have you know, daily accidents of those kind of things. So I think the two, most two challenges we have to solve via real action is actually the sustainability and economy of hydrogen. So when it comes to this, I think we need real action on, on this. So this is what we have done. I think there is no other ways than doing this, 
putting the investment in the real projects. So app products starting doing this, I think a few years ago, actually in the blue hydrogen in Alberta, um, also in Louisiana that we have just uh, commenced um, the construction a few years ago. Um, so this all complex, these both complexes are blue hydrogen, again with the uh, you know uh, carbon uh, capture storage in place, and these two complexes are uh, target for on stream in 2026. The other thing that is just uh, very close to UAE is Neom. And we also have invested over there um, since uh, 2020. And this is the green hydrogen complex. So far, it's still the largest green complex, uh, the largest hydrogen complex in the world now. Um, so it's also slated for on stream in 2026, 27. So this all requires real commitments, real investment, so that we can make the uh, sustainability and the economy of hydrogen just happen. Back to Thailand, where we all live. Um, although we are not having large projects like we have in Neom and in the um, US, but again, I think in Thailand, since we have petrochemical industry complex in Mataput, then we can have a byproduct hydrogen that we can use. And currently, we have a number of hydrogen energy transition projects, starting from hydrogen for mobility. We just put the first hydrogen um, mobility station in Pattaya, which is the eastern part of Thailand, just last year. We also initiated the bus uh, with the hydrogen for mobility forklift with hydrogen for mobility. So this has been um, ongoing. We also have developed experiments with um, hydrogen for steel industry in Thailand. And also, we set up Hydrogen Council in Thailand, where I think most of us uh, on, on the stage and you know, uh, some of you uh, as audience also join. So this is what we have done is try to push this so that we can have more sustainable and more economic hydrogen as a clean energy in Thailand. So last part is about ecosystem. I think when we talk about climate change, we talk about hydrogen, Although we are the largest hydrogen producer in the world, we realize that we cannot alone do this. So we have to work together with Kunoposit, with uh, Professor Varong and everyone. So that's why we form um, CCUS Consortium. Because we think at some point in time, we have to generate blue hydrogen in Thailand where we have natural gas and we crack that together with the CCUS um, Consortium, then we can have more sustainable and more economic hydrogen available for powering hard to abate segments in Thailand. And if you look at the um, uh, Thailand roadmap, I think we talk about 2045 to introduce green hydrogen. Uh, I think that's a bit uh, too late. So what we are trying to do that between now and 2045, what we can do, and I think blue hydrogen with CCUS is the answer. The ton of CO2 that we can save today it's more meaningful than the ton of CO2 that we can save in 2045. So let's be realistic and let's put the action together with all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kun Piyabut. So, so you can see some, something in common as uh, we start with uh, Perso Warong, right, who, who start mentoring about um, the CCUS consortium. That uh, I, I think this, uh, this kind of consortium is one of the, the good things, you know, good evidence that uh, to put everyone to work together, okay, uh, and, and also we, we can listen from um, Dr. Nopasit and conclude again with Kun uh, Piyabut, okay, related with the, um, the role of the, of the hydrogen that uh, I, I, I totally agree with you about 2045 because I also read that one also. <laughs> and, and CCUS, especially the storage along that way, the, we, we can see in, in the map, as uh, Dr. Nopasit already showed us, that um, we, we have the, the main sources around country, around six or, or five um, area, right? And the balancing in between the sink and source is important for sure. For the next speaker, he will join with us online. <laughs> because uh, Dr. Noreen Pawanit, he, uh, he, he has some specific uh, missions, so he can join us on, on site today. So Dr. Noreen from, uh, from ICAT prepared some um, video 
you know, to share with all of us today. So take time to, to listen to Dr. Noreen. Okay, Rob. สวัสดีครับ Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Noreen p a w a n i c h I'm Assistant Governor of the Field Management of the Electricity Generating Authority of Thailand, or ECAT. Today, it is my pleasure and honor to be here to walk you through the ECAT emission reduction targets and contribution of the advanced technologies. Um, we will, I would like to start from the Thailand carbon neutral policies. The government has pledged to reach net zero carbon emission by 2065 at COP26, and also we pledge to reach the carbon neutrality by 2050. The Ministry of Energy then implement a green energy plan. They have introduced 4D1E policies, decarbonization, decentralization, digitalization, deregulations, and electrifications, and also they implement Plan which include the renewable energy more than 50% in the power development plan. They have campaign EV3030. They also have a campaign for the energy efficiency. Coming to ECAT, we are a state of enterprise under the Ministry of Energy, so we introduced the triple S strategy. Start from source transformation, sink co-creation, and support measure mechanisms. The first is source transformation. We would like to introduce more and more clean source of fuel for the power generation. We will deploy more and more renewable energy, grid modernization, and future technologies, including the hydrogen. Second one, since we also have, we still have a fossil fuel power plant, so we believe that the sink co-creation would be necessary. We would like to increase carbon sink and sequestration collaboratively. We we'll introduce carbon capture, utilization, and storage, or CCUS, to, in the commercialized scale in 2045. We also have the campaign for the reforestation project. Last but not least, we believe that uh, strong support from the stakeholder is very important to reach net zero and carbon neutralities. So we have a support measure mechanism. In various way, the most famous one is level number five, which will be continue. We also introduce the biosecure green economy. Start from a wind hydrogen hybrid system for the hydrogen. We have one project in Lam Takong area. It's the very good example of the source transformation. This pilot project. Um, is the first wind hydrogen hybrid system in Asia. We use wind turbine to generate electricity, and then use that electricity through the, the P electrolyzers to generate um, hydrogen. The fuel, and from hydrogen, we use to generate power to, through the fuel cell. We have 300 kilowatts of electricity with proton exchange membrane fuel cell. That power is used to power um, ECAT lighting center in Lam Takong, meaning that this um, lighting center is truly clean power source. We use the only um, green power to supply to this uh, lighting center. Next, after we successfully complete the first project. ECAP also has another um, hydrogen project. It's a so-called ECAT Energy Excellence Center. This learning center is in the headquarters of ECAT in the Chaburi area. This project is a collaboration between ECAT, Pan Phi Sur in Chiang Mai province, and Adapter company from Germany. The aim of this project is to enhance knowledge and understanding in the acquisition and establishment of hydrogen energy storage system with other energy management systems. We need we would like to carry out the microgrid pilot project at this area as well. We install solar power at the roof and then use this solar power to generate electricity. Use this electricity for the 
electrolyzer to generate uh, hydrogen. In the future, as um, power, the, uh, power supply company in Thailand, we believe that hydrogen is one of the key fuel in the future. We can use hydrogen through the fuel cell to generate, generate electricity as we have used in the Lambda Kong wind hybrid system. We can use hydrogen as a fuel for the combined cycle power plant. We can use hydrogen to blend with the natural gas and use it in the combined cycle power plant as well. We can use hydrogen and convert to ammonia, use it co firing with our um, existing coal fired power plant and produce electricity, which we also have a plan for our, our power plant in northern part of Thailand. Last but not least, hydrogen can be used as an energy storage system. We can use the excess electricity produced the hydrogen from electrolyzer and store in storage tank or underground storage tank and use it as a source to generate power when we need it. Next one, uh, once we do the source transformation, as I mentioned earlier on, sink co-creation is also one of the key important. We would like to deploy um, carbon capture utilization and storage in commercialized scale by 2045. This year, we start from laboratory scale. We have three projects in hand right now. The first one is the utilization of the captured carbon. It is the study of direct hydrogenation of CO2 to methanol for decarbonization from the gas flow of the power plant. We use it for the combined cycle power plant. The second project is to production of calcium carbonate from flue gas desulfurization, gypsum, and capture carbon dioxide. This project is implemented at the thermal power plant. We believe that if we can produce the synthetic calcium carbonate, we can use this in our process, and we don't want to um, use natural resources or reduce the use of natural resources. Last but not least, for this, pro this year, we start to do the um, this study of the CCS project in Memo area. We hope we can have very small scale of the first pilot plant by 2024. And we can, that uh, pilot plant could be COD by 2027. And by 2030, sometimes we, we, we should have first demonstration plant in the large, largest scale. And then 2040, we should have a first operating plant. Uh, for the large size or uh, existing power plant of ECA, we have two potential areas. The first one in the northern part of Thailand, as I mentioned earlier, on Memo power plant. We have um, the Memo power plant has a production capacity of more than 2,000 megawatts. It's a coal-fired power plant. It initially started in 1972. The CO2 emission release is about 14 million tons per year. This area is possible for both utilization and storage. Because as I mentioned earlier, we have a one, one laboratory scale project. And also we believe that um, in Memo, we have a potential area for storage as well. The second location is in the northeastern part of Thailand. ICAT has a Nampong combined cycle power plant in Konkan province. It's composed gas and steam turbine power generation since 1990. Total capacity of 710 megawatts. Emission release each year is about uh, almost 2 million tons of CO2. This area is possible for both utilization and storage. As I mentioned earlier, we have one project for utilization, which produces flue gas from the combined cycle power plant. And in the Nampong area, is close to the gas field. So we believe that uh, the empty gas field can be used as a 
media to store this capture CO2. In addition to um, hydrogen and carbon capture, ECAT has a plan to transition from coal to biomass. Uh, we have we start one um, project already, and then we will increase percent share of the biomass fuel pellet until we reach 100%. We believe that our, from our cal calculations, uh, we, we, if we start from 300 megawatt power plant, we can use the wood pellet need to be used is more than 1 million tons per year. From that, um, the carbon dioxide reduction might be about uh, almost 2 million tons per year as well. We can use uh, agricultural waste as a source or raw materials for wood pellet production, and then we transport to the plant and use it in our power plant. We believe that uh, shifting from coal to biomass will help uh, reduce the CO2 as well as prosperity of the community around the, near the power plant. Last but not least, I would propose that we need to help each other. We need to help each other to connect the dot to tackle or to combat the climate change, paving the way for the healthy planet in the near future. Thank you very much. So please give a big hand to Dr. Norin, who even he can join us today, but he prepared very complete and comprehensive thing that uh, the largest uh, state-owned enterprise in Thailand in, in terms of the uh, electricity generation who interesting and deal with this one. You can see the, the, the combined, the CCUS thing, the hydrogen things, and, and also the laboratory, laboratory scale that Dr. Noreen mentioned. That uh, Luckily, that today we, we have uh, Dr. Krit Chat okay, from uh, uh, Faculty of Engineering who join hand with this, uh, with this project. So maybe Dr. Krichat can, can show us a little bit for more detail a little bit on, on this one, please. Yes, of course. Thank you for the introduction. Yep. Actually, I'm very happy to be here because I'm working with ECAT and yep. uh, especially the carbon utilization for, for the ECAT itself. So let's talk a little bit about why CO2 is so hard to deal with because everyone talking about CO2, CO2, but why is it so hard? Like for me, the major things that I think it is a little bit challenging are three kind of things. The first thing is that because it is gas phase, and the gas phase is trained to disperse a lot, and we are very hard to to deal with the gas phase. This is the first thing, and the second thing is because we have large amount of emission of CO2 into the world, so at that large amount is also very hard to deal with, even though it's liquid as well. So the large amount is a problem. And the first thing which is most important is, is very stable. Imagine that we, we have, after combustion, uh, we can have CO2 like carbon dioxide and also water. Those things are the two things that's quiet, stable. It's, so it's very hard to, to change it into other chemicals. So that is why uh, we need to do something. And for me, I'm working on CCU, so it means we have to do something about that. And in order for that to, to, to make some change, because gas phase is hard to storage and also hard to transport, of course. And because of high emission rate, it's very hard to find some place to, to place. But luckily, luckily, we have uh, CCS. CCS that we can do something about that. But in any case, as Professor Wallong said that we need to have many, many kinds of options that we need to deal with because not many places have the right or, or full option that we, we can do it. So as, much, as many options as possible is the good thing for, for today. And the last thing is because uh, is chemical stability is very hard to convert to other chemicals, so it's quite limited uh, species that we can go forward. So that is why is very, very unique thing. We, we need a lot of ways to, to go forward for the CO2. The one thing is, as already mentioned, we can go for CCS. Of course, this is a very large amount of CO2 that we can go into the sequestration. 
but of course, some of the CO2 have to be converted into the other thing as well. Uh, this is called utilization, right? And we can go for many chemical possible or many fuel possible, right? Uh, the chemical or the fuel that are possible, so we are list here, this is a lot, a lot of products that we can go for into the carbon dioxide. We can go for fuel, we can go for bioproduct, and we can go for many chemicals as well. But what should be the chemical that we should go for? Uh, from my point of view and uh, research that we are going to go is to try to convert CO2 into some kind of liquid or solid, whatever possible, because CO2 is the thing that I already mentioned that it's quite hard to, 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 do, to deal with it because it is gas phase, right? So if we can convert them into liquid phase, because liquid phase is, uh, have like many, many advantages over gas phase storage in terms of like uh, the same amount of CO2, if it convert into liquid, it will be like 50 less volume times than the gas. So it means that we can store it more and more if we convert them into liquid. And not just that, we can store them at room temperature as well. If we have to store it to gas, normally we have to store at very high pressure and we know that as we are, you have already mentioned that it's quite dangerous. So that is also mean that if we can store it, that CO2 in terms of liquid, it doesn't have to be CO2 itself. It can be any liquid possible or any solid possible so we can have a, another options for our CO2 uh, reduction, of course. So, and the other things that we need to focus on, not just any liquid, so we need a liquid or, or any kind of liquids that can be a product itself and also can be converted into other products as well. Because at the moment, if we have like 200 uh, million tons per year and we convert every single CO2 into liquid, of course, it's going to be like over the market and we cannot uh, sell everything. So it's not like economically good for, for the thing. So that is why we need to have many options. And the options that uh, we are trying to, to improve nowadays is for some industrial or some uh, power plant. Of course, you have a limited space on the current operating system. So if we can add some like a little bit add up for the unit and that unit can convert CO2 into any liquid. And we collect that liquid to just one place mm -hmm. and then convert them into another chemicals or sell them or purify them. Right. This should be like another options or another idea that we can go for. So that is the idea that we develop it with EGAT and try to convert uh, the one of the options is to convert them from CO2 into methanol, of course. But right now, uh, as Professor Barong said that methanol itself is not that uh, sufficient because we have to go for other chemical as well because methanol itself is just 1.5 million tons per, per year. So we need to convert it to another chemical, but it's, it's in the research. It means that right now we need to go for some kind of liquid first, which is now methanol, and then we can go further after this one. And at the moment, uh, the current research that we are doing, uh, we a little bit call it a little bit success. We, we did a pilot plan, a small one, uh, that can be located in the lab laboratory. And we have like many, many methanols, uh, liquid well that you can see over there uh, came out. And we can now put the methanol to the maximum uh, thermodynamic possible at the pressure around 40, 45 bars. This is quite uh, good for the moment, but we are trying to go further into like develop a better energy efficiency for, for this kind of thing because we know the energy efficiency for uh, the, this kind of operation is very, very important. So that should be the next, next phase that we are going with EGAT and should be in the next two or three years as Professor, uh, Dr. Narin said that we are going to develop it together. And that's how the thing that we should go further because right now if we have methanol and just for EGAT, for example, they have like 15 million tons of methanol per year, which is a lot, a lot, and also cannot be covered in the market. So it means that in the future, we need to move that methanol into some other chemicals. 
and many chemicals you already mentioned. We can go for fuel. We can also go for like ethylene or propylene as well. And that ethylene and propylene can also go to be a polymer yeah. that we are using today. It's, very, uh, it's a very good solid that we can store the CO2 as well. So the, I think right now the methanol is very uh, like important and very uh, high potential for the liquid phase that it can store CO2 at first and then convert that methanol into some other thing afterwards. That should be the, the potential of the methanol. But in any case, we have to come back again. In order to convert CO2 to methanol, we also require hydrogen. Mm. The hydrogen is always in the reaction, or most of the reaction that convert CO2 into some other chemicals mostly require hydrogen. So we come back again here, <laughs> that we need you. <laughs> we need everyone that we want the hydrogen to, to be in the CCS, oh sorry, CCU, yes, to convert CO2 into some other chemicals uh, as much as possible. And we have many kinds of options for hydrogen, of course, gray, blue, and green. But from my study with my students, I, we also found that in order for the process to be like economically possible, the price of the hydrogen need to be lower from 1,000 US per ton, go down around to 500, ton, 500 US per ton, which is half of the price. Which <laughs> maybe, I don't know if it's possible or not, but this is uh, the way that if we want to do the CCU in terms of the price, uh, we need to go for that, and I hope you can do that, please. <laughs> so that should be what our research, not, not just me, uh, uh, our, in our department in Jibralongkorn University, we are doing a lot of things, not just methanol. We have some kind of CO, calcium carbonate. We are, have many, many things that we are going for. The methanol is just one of the um, example that we can go for the CCU at the moment. Yeah. So give a big hand to um, Dr. Krita. Okay. So I, I believe that today we, even in early in the morning, Okay, but we can see some uh, interaction and the uh, and the chain value good value chain. Because when, when we start with the, the thing that we call um, CCUS consortium, okay, and all of the consortium already join hand in, in this sessions. And also thank you to, to our dean and also Dr. Support for Teisha Warsin Sakun who who one of the the big leader to make this kind of the, the consortium uh, occur and we can see some, some good progress on, on this one. So I, I believe that maybe we, we have around one or two minutes left, you know, because uh, we, we start a little bit late. So another session waiting for us also. I'm not sure any of, of you would like to mention something in, for the conclusions. Uh, Dr. Nopasit or Kun Piyabut, please. I'm probably going to uh, take a look at the bigger picture. I think decarbonization, CCUS, or whatever hydrogen, it will only add cost, mm. right? Yeah, so I think for us, you know, being uh, developing economies, uh, how we're gonna make sure that we can, uh, we're not gonna pass the cost on to end consumers, right? I think we need help from uh, international communities to make it happen. So the big guys need to help little guys. Yeah. Totally agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> We should yes. help each other. Okay. Could be about that. Yes. Uh, I, I think um, you know between now and 2050 or 65, whatever you want to achieve the net zero. What we want to make it happen is actually we have to drive energy transition, and energy transition, as I said, it will come only with real action and collaboration. And for the collaboration, I think we're not to say talking already, but I would like to also focus that the ecosystem of collaboration. Uh, you know, it, it's the, the underlying of this value is on the expertise. So whether you're the big guy, you're the small guy, it may not matter. What matters is expertise in the ecosystem, right? So uh, I think PTEP could opposite said expertise on the CCS. Myself, expertise in hydrogen, and, you know, and all the professors in here are expertise in academic research, and we could make all this together happen. So, I mean, we would like to invite all of you. Expertise is what we really need. Thank you. Thank you, Kun Piyabut. The last one, uh, okay, Dr. Warong. <laughs> uh, I think 
the takeaway message for today is that we are driven to the edge already. Right now, we are at the edge, and we need everybody right now. And it's no time for discussion, no time for argument anymore. It is the time for action, and we need to do it now. Okay, Cap. So, give a big hand to all of our speaker for today. And we do hope that uh, the CCUS and the hydrogen for uh, energy transition today that is quite technical or scientific uh, can provide you something. Okay, and we, we do hope that it should be a fruitful uh, result. And when we come back, hopefully that um, the consortium and the, uh, the working hand, joint hand together should be, uh, become more and more high impactful for our country not only for Thailand, but I believe for all of this global, all of this world. Thank you very much, Kap. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for all speakers. Uh, you are all uh, expertise and also a passion for uh, CCUF and also uh, the hydrogen aspect shown throughout the, the presentations and for everyone involved. Uh, we would like to give you uh, the Thailand Pavilion uh, for some uh, souvenir for all speakers. Uh, please accept for uh, all of us. Uh, okay. <laughs>